Hello, dear classmate. Welcome back to the advanced topic video. In this video, we are going to talk about a very useful technique, Power Aware ATPG. It is a well-known problem that test power is much higher than functional power. This is because of two reasons. First, when we shift the scan chain, we can induce a lot of switching activities in logic. And the second reason is that ATPG patterns are random input patterns that are not used in functional mode. So the designer may not consider the power of these random patterns. So the problems of high test power can be as follows. First, we can have test overkill. That means good CUT can fail the testing due to large power supply noise. This has been published in a TI paper in 2003. And also, the second problem is high test power can reduce the lifetime or reliability of our CUT. And in the worst case, high test power can even damage our CUT. Although this does not happen very often, but test power is really a serious concern, especially when we talk about testing for high performance chips. So there are two types of test power that we are interested in. First, shift power. When the scan enable is one and the scan chain is shifting, in the shift mode, there are a lot of switching activities going on in the logic. If we want to reduce shift power, we can simply use slower speed shift. However, the second type, capture problem, occurs when the scan enable is equal to zero. That means when we capture the logic response. This is especially a serious concern for S-speed testing when the test speed is required to be fast. So, how can we reduce these two types of test power? There have been some DFT design for testability solutions proposed. First, we can try to stagger our shift clock to reduce the shift power. As is shown in this figure, we can slightly shift the phase of shift clock so that this two clock rising edge does not overlap. In this way, we can reduce the power supply noise caused by simultaneous logic switching. And the second one is called capture clock gating. In this technique, we gate some of the capture clock so that a certain percentage of free flops are not toggling. This helps to reduce the simultaneous capture power. Finally, we can have test clock partition. This technique simply apply different test clock so that some scan chains are shifted by clock 1 the other scan chain are shifted by clock 2. In this way we can reduce the shift power at the cost of longer test time. If we also shift the capture clock we can also reduce the capture power. So in conclusion, DFT solutions are very effective and they require none or little change in ATPG. However, DFT solutions 
has the following disadvantage. First, it requires area overhead, and sometimes the test time is longer. And we also require more complicated physical or DFT design flow to accommodate more test clocks and perform timing verification. So DFT solution alone is not good enough. Now let's look at some ATPG solutions. First, let us understand power supply noise. And the uh, ATPG model. This figure shows a power grid model. There are some resistance and uh, inductance capacitance. The power supply noise, PSN, is a function of time that can be decomposed into two parts. One part is associated with inductance. And the other part is associated with resistance. So the first part is also known as the DIDT power supply node. It is a low frequency or mid frequency noise. It is a serious concern for packaging design, which is out of the scope of this lecture. So in this lecture, we will we will focus on the second type of power supply noise, the IR drop and the ground bounce, which is a high frequency noise. This is particularly a serious concern for testing. This figure shows an illustration of the concept of IR drop. The upper black line shows a. Ideal VDD and the lower black line shows the ideal ground. When we apply a clock at the positive edge of this clock and negative edge of this clock, some flip flops in this design will be triggered, so they will change their state and induce many logic switching activity. So that we will see IR drop in the VDD. We also see ground bounce. So that our power supply noise is no longer a constant. This is called a power integrity issue. The right figure shows our analysis result. The IR drop distribution of a benchmark circuit B19. Is shown in this figure. The nominal VDD is 0.9 volt. Out of the 1,980 PG test patterns, there are almost one fifth, that is 400 test patterns, which has IR drop more than 0.317 volt, which are quite dangerous. We call them IR drop. Risky test patterns. So we can see that we need to solve this problem when we generate ATPG test patterns. However, IR drop analysis is a very slow process. The current I is equal to the conductance matrix Y multiplied by the vector V. If we want to solve for the voltage V. Then we need to perform a inverse on the conductance matrix Y, which is a very large matrix. So this is a very time-consuming process. During ATPG, we actually don't have so much time for detailed IR drop analysis. So some people propose alternative matrix for IR drop. The first one is. FFTC free flop toggle count. We just simply count the number of free flop that toggle. For example, suppose we have four free flop in the circuit. If their activities are like this, then the total toggle count is just two, because two free flop are flip. This is a very simple 
matrix, which does not consider activity in the logic. So some people also propose weighted switching activity WSA, which is a weighted summation of gate output that toggle. In this equation, WI is a user defined weight. SI is the switching activity of gate output. Now let's do a quiz. Given this circuit and uh, a pair of test patterns V1, V2, please calculate the WSA of this pattern pair. Suppose that the weight of inverter is 1 and the other gates are 2. Now you can calculate WSA according to this equation. Please pause the video and do this quiz. OK, are you finished? The output of gate G1E is changing from 0 to 1. So we have a toggle here. And the H also, we have a toggle here. And the J is changing from 1 to 0. So we also have a switching activity. However, K is not switching. So there is no switching activity. So if we do this summation, then we can know that WSA is equal to 5. Have you got it correctly? OK, now let me show you how to calculate FFTC during a scan test application. We know that there are two different modes in a scan chain. In the shift mode, we shift in and out our test patterns. In this example, suppose we have a scan chain of four free flops. So originally, 1010 is in this scan chain. After a shift clock, the first bit is changed to 0, the second bit is changed to 1, and the third bit is changed to 0. The fourth bit remains 0. So in this scan clock, the FF toggle count is 3. Similarly, after the second shift clock, two bits are toggled. After the third and the fourth scan clock, now 0010 0 has been loaded into the scan chain. Now we will start the capture mode. In this example, we use launch on capture, and we have three capture clocks. Starting from the first time frame, free flop number one is originally zero. After the capture clock, it is changed to one. Please note that these two free flops are actually the same free flop. And then free flop two is unchanged. Free flop three is changed to zero. Free flop four is unchanged. So in the first time frame, we have two free flop toggles. Similarly, after the second capture clock, we have three free flop toggle. And after the last capture clock, we have one free flop toggle. The free flop in red color indicate toggle free flop. So this is how we calculate free flop toggle count during a scan test. Now let's see what kind of technique can we use to reduce shift power. A very useful technique to reduce shift power is the adjacent field, which is also known as minimum transition field. The idea is very simple. To avoid shift power, ATPG fills 
the unknown bit or x the same value as its neighbors. This is a fast and effective technique because typically in test cubes there are many many don't cares to fill in. For example, suppose our test cube is like this 0x 1x. After adjacent fill, we will fill a 0 to this bit and fill a 1 to this bit. In this way, we can avoid flip-flop toggle during scan. Similarly, if we have many continuous don't care bits such as 0xxx1, xxx, we can still perform similar idea to fill them as 00001111. So adjacent fill is an easy technique to reduce ship power. Now it's time for you to work on a quiz. Suppose that in this circuit the inverter weight is 1 and the other gate weight are 2. Suppose PI is hold constant 0 and the last bit of last pattern is 0. Given a test cube 0x x x 0. Now please calculate the FFTC and WSA of the random field pattern 0 1 0 0 and also calculate the FFTC of the adjacent field 0 0 0 0 now please pause the video and work on this quiz have you finished? after one shift clock every bit is shifted up by one bit so this would be 0, this would be 1, and this would be 0, this would be also 0. In this way, the OR gate would be toggled from 0 to 1. So we have a toggle transition here, and then the NOR output would be changed from 1 to 0. Also, the OR gate would be changed from 0 to 1. So the weighted Switching activity, it, the logic is 6 and the FFTC is 2. So 2 and 6 for the random field test pattern. On the right hand side, because there is no transition, so FFTC is 0 and uh, no logic is changed. So WSA is also 0. Have you got it correctly? Now let's introduce ATPG solution to reduce capture power. There are two famous techniques. The LCP field and the preferred field technique. Low capture power field or LCP field technique was proposed by Professor Wen at Kyushu Institute of Technology. The idea of LCP field is to minimize FFTC during the capture. Let's discuss LCP field in four cases. In case 1, suppose there is no unknown bit in PPI pseudo primary input or in the corresponding PPO pseudo primary output. In this case, there is nothing we can do because FFTC is already decided. In this picture, it is 3. So we cannot further improve FFTC. So we just maybe fill in the primary input value to reduce WSA in the logic. Please notice that in this picture, this free flop is the same as this free flop. They are just shown to indicate the value before the capture clock and after 
the capture club. Now let's consider case two. In this case, there are some PPI whose value is unknown, but all the PPO have been decided already. So in this case, we just simply assign PPI the same value as its corresponding PPO. For example, we just assign PPI1 to be 0, which is the same as PPO1. And we assign PPI3 as PPO3. In this case, the FFTC of this test pattern is simply 1. Now, let's consider case 3. In this case, there is no PPI which is a norm, but there are some PPO and some PI which are unknown. To handle this case, we can fill PI to justify such that PPI is equal to its corresponding PPO. For example, we want to justify a 0 at PPO1. So we need fill PI to be 1. In this way, we can reduce the toggle in PPI1. For this test pattern, the free flat toggle count is 1. Here is one notice about this case. When there are multiple PPO of unknown values, the author proposed to choose PPO that has the most number of unknown PPI in its fan in cone. This is one heuristic proposed by the paper. In the fourth case, in this case there are some PPI of unknown values and also there are some PPO of unknown values. In this case, we can characterize the bit pair into four types. In type A, both PBI and the PPO have been decided. So we cannot do anything about it. In type B, PBI is unknown, but PPO is already decided. For example, PPI3 is a norm, but PPO3 is already 1. For type C, PPI is already assigned, but PPO has not decided yet. For type D, both PPI and the PPO are a norm. In the paper, a criterion was proposed. If type B is more than type C, then we process type B first. Otherwise, we process type C first. After we have processed all type B and the type C free flop pairs, then we start to process type D. In this example, we have equal number of type B and type C. So let's say we process type B first. So we fill in PPI3 to be 1. And then we can fill in type C to justify PPO2 to be 0. And finally, we can justify PPO1 to be 0. In this way, the total free flop toggle count is 1 in this pattern. Here is the LCP field algorithm. Starting from a test cube with a known value, we first determine its case. If it's case 1, then we can simply fill in the primary input and finish. If it's type 2, we can also simply assign the PPI and then we back to the loop. If it is type 3, we can use Criterion 1 to justify PPO. If it is type 4, 
then we can further decide if we want to handle type B or type C by criterion 2. Or we can decide how to handle type D by criterion 1. Now it's time for you to work on a quiz. This is a case 4 in LCP field. Please tell me what are the types of bit pairs and also please follow the algorithm to fill in PI and PBI to reduce FFTC. Now please pause the video and work on this quiz. Okay, have you finished? For fifth flop, number one is type A because inputs PBI and the output PBO have been decided. The second free flop is type B and then this is type C, this is type D. Starting from type B, we can fill in this as 1, which is the same as its PBO. And then to justify this as a 0, we will fill in this as 0. Finally, this is 1. So the FFTC of this pattern is totally 1 and uh, 2. So its total number is 2. Have you got it correctly? LCP field is very time consuming. In reality, there are many, many unknown bits to fill in. Is there any faster way to do it? Let's now introduce a preferred field proposed by Mentor. Before we understand preferred field, we review the concept of COP. The signal probability of X denoted as CX means the probability of X being logic 1. When we calculate COP, we assume that gate inputs are independent. So CX of N output is simply the product of CA and the CB. The idea of preferred field is to fill in the most likely PBO value to its corresponding PBI. So we can calculate CX from input to output. Let's say starting from the priming input and the pseudo priming input, we assume equal probability of 0 and 1. Starting from the input, we can calculate CX to the output. For example, for this PPO, its CX is 1 half. For the output of OR gate, the CX is equal to 3 quarters. The probability of 0 is 1 quarter. Similarly, this one is the same. And for the NOR gate output, the probability of output being 1 is just 1 eighth which is much smaller than the probability of 0. Now we can easily decide the value to fill in. If CX of PPO is larger than a half, which means it is more likely to be 1, then we simply fill in the PPI as 1. Otherwise, we fill in PPI as 0. So for this one, we can randomly fill the PPI. For this two, the signal probability is larger than half. So they are filled in as one. For this bit, the probability of zero is higher than a half. So we fill in as zero. So in summary, prefer fill is very fast and scalable because we just do this 
COP calculation once, and then we can fill in all the test patterns. Now, let's show some experimental results. This is experimental data from the TI experiment published in 2003. In this figure, they show different test patterns of different switching activity. Starting from very high switching activity patterns all the way down to very low switching activity patterns. And this column shows V-min, which is the minimum functional VDD. Lower V-min means that this circuit can work at the lower VDD, which is more power saving. So the specified V-min is 1.35 volt. However, in testing, they found that some V-min is much higher than the other V-min and turned out it's highly correlated with the switching activity of the pattern. So if we apply high switching activity pattern to test the circuit, the circuit may fail the test. However, if we apply low switching activity pattern, the circuit can pass the test. So this experiment showed that power supply noise may cause test overkill if we use high switching activity test patterns. This experiment was performed by NTU in 2021. We compare power aware test patterns and power unaware test patterns. It's a 45 nanometer technology and the nominal VDD is 0.9 volt. We use a popular commercial ATPG tool and we use machine learning tool to help us quickly predict IR drop. This is a modern technique to reduce IR analysis runtime. For power unaware ATPG pattern generation. For one benchmark circuit B19, we analyze the IR drop distribution, which is like this. We found out that almost 20% test pattern has IR drop higher than 0.317 volt, which are risky to apply because of test overkill. If we use power aware ATPG and reduce FFTC by 10%, we can see that the test length of power aware ATPG is 6.2% longer than power unaware ATPG pattern. And the runtime is 47% longer. So in summary, test power is much larger than functional power. So we can suffer from test overkill or reduce our reliability. There have been many DFT solutions such as clock staggering, clock gating, clock partition. They are effective, but they cost area or design overhead. There are also ATPG solutions which use flip-flop toggle count or WSA as IR drop matrix. We have introduced adjacent field to reduce shift power. We also re introduce LCP field and the preferred field to reduce capture power. The advantage of power with ATPG pattern is that we can avoid test overkill. And the disadvantage of power with ATPG is that we suffer from test length inflation and also runtime overhead. Now this concludes a power aware ATPG.
Thank you for watching.